So now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alyssa Wolberg, and she's going to speak on new methods for measuring plasma generation from mice to humans. She's a professor of pathology and lab medicine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She currently chairs the ASH Committee on Scientific Affairs and the NIH Hemostasis Thrombosis Blood Cells and Transfusion Studies section. Dr. Wilberg's research laboratory contribute, uh, studies contributions of fibrin and fibrinogen factor 13 and red cells to thrombosis, mechanisms in cancer-associated thrombosis, and hormone-associated thrombosis, and mechanisms that mediate clot formation and stability in hemophilia and factor 11 deficiency. Hopefully I can figure out this button. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to present here um, today. I know that I'm a little bit of an outlier and that I am truly a basic researcher, a translational researcher in a room of clinicians, and I'm about to talk quite a bit about our studies with mice, and then I'm going to try and relate our studies with mice to how we've um, advanced this into making it helpful, hopefully, to um, more clinical, clinically relevant scenarios with humans. All right, and I actually did have two disclosures um, uh, research funding from Takeda, and I'm a consultant for New York Blood Center, but I won't present those data here, so maybe they're non, not relevant uh, disclosures. Um, the learning objectives that I have for um, my talk is that by the end of this, I hope you'll be able to discuss rationales for using mice to advance understanding of human pathophysiology. Um, I also hope that you'll be able to describe the strengths as well as the limitations of plasma-based plasma generation assays in both preclinical and in clinical settings. So hopefully this will give you a good vocabulary for covering all of those. So we've spent a lot of time in my lab trying to understand really simple procedures. Um, that is the um, conversion of soluble blood components to the formation. Uh-oh. It's supposed to form a clot. There. OK, it formed a clot. It's going to demonstrate bleeding in real time. Um, and so th we've made a lot of headway in this and tried to understand quite a bit about this, but as Nigel just really um, nicely covered, um, the process by which that clot breaks down in the fibrinolytic pathways has been far less understood, and there's a much more, many more gaps in that process. And that's really caught our attention in recent years, and that's what we've turned a lot of our attention to. That's illustrated here. Um, you can see the simplified version of a um, coagulation cascade. You see the extrinsic pathway and intrinsic pathway and culminating here in the conversion of um, prothrombin to thrombin. And then um, thrombin, of course, converts fibrinogen to fibrin, and what is my favorite reaction in the coagulation cascade. Um, for about 20 years, there's been a really nice assay that's able to quantify this phase right here, and that is the thrombin generation assay. And I think at this point, most people have seen this. Um, it's marked by the ability to describe this process with a finer vocabulary than what we would normally have in simple clotting assays. So we no longer have to say the clot did or didn't form, or it was delayed, or in some cases early. But we can now actually talk about what phase of that process is abnormal. And so it gives us a better understanding of the molecular mechanisms that are um, limited or compromised in different individuals, and enables us to go one step further in understanding what the um, phenotype may result from. So secondary to the formation <coughs> of fibrin, is this process here that Nigel also just talked about, where the TPA-mediated conversion of plasminogen to plasmin um, results in the conversion of fibrin to fibrin degradation products. And of course, the most famous of this is D-dimer. So even though the uh, production of plasmin is in many ways just like the production of thrombin, there have been far less attention on how we quantify that. Um, and so there's a gap in the field then, or has been a substantial gap in the field, in a workable plasmin generation assay that could be used hand in hand with a thrombin generation assay to try to understand both sides of this process. So I want to um, actually be really clear, though, to say we're not the first to think of this, and we're not the first to try to develop one of these assays. And so I'm highlighting a few of these that have occurred over about the last 10 years or so, as well as our assay here that was um, developed largely by a former postdoc in my lab, Adam Mischa. 
You know, all of these assays have um, nuances that make them somewhat distinct from each other, but fundamentally they're actually pretty nuanced in that they all start with tissue factor concentrations and calcium and plasma, and they're all basically carried out in a rather similar fashion. And I'm going to talk about that just a little bit more. In our assay, we started with um, mouse plasma, and I'm going to come back to that in a slide and tell you why we did that, because it's a little strange, um, but I think it was a good decision. Um, what we do is we take that plasma and we trigger clotting in it by adding tissue factor and lipids. And we also add exogenous TPA in a fashion just like um, you just heard from Nigel. And then the thing that makes our assay a little bit different from the other assays is that we use this calibrator. It's an alpha-2 macroglobulin plasmin complex. And it's the same kind of complex that's used in the thrombin generation assay. And the use of that complex, complex enables us to get past um, inner filter effects and some problems reading fluorescence as this assay takes place. We um, read out the development of plasmin by its ability to cleave a fluorogenic substrate. So when the substrate is cleaved, it fluoresces, and we can pick that up. And the substrate that we've used here is an EKK substrate, and that's the same substrate that was used in several of these earlier studies. And then the reaction itself is actually triggered when calcium is added to it. And in that way, too, it's exactly the same as the thrombin generation assay or calibrated automated thrombogram. So we also do the same mathematical manipulation to take these accrual of fluorescence into something that's interpretable. So this curve should start to look really familiar to you. We apply the same parameters that we're really comfortable with in terms of thrombin generation assays. And if I put up here, this is a thrombin generation curve. So you're not crazy. It looks exactly like that. And we use the same parameters. And our application of that actually made this a really easy assay to transition from the knowledge that we had on what drives thrombin generation and immediately begin talking about what it is that does or does not drive plasma generation. All right, I told you I'd come back to why we started with mice instead of human plasma, and we did that for a number of reasons. All right, first, um, like humans, mice are a mammal with many biological characteristics of humans. Um, and you can see that they're located quite close on the evolutionary scale here. The genome is about 99% similar to humans. I guess that doesn't include the tail, but really we have an awful lot in common with these mice. Um, because of that, we share um, coagulation biology and biochemistry between mice and humans, and a lot of it actually transitions quite well. The thing that mice add that humans don't is reproducibility. Um, we can um, get similarity between individual mice that we just can't obtain with individual humans, and so we can do far fewer assays and know better what it is that we're dealing with than the kind of diversity and heterogeneity that you're used to dealing with in terms of understanding from one patient to another, which can be a limitation in studies and really drive up the number of individuals you have to look at to reach a conclusion. The mice also offer us a really nice molecular toolbox um, through the use of targeted genetic manipulations. So we can knock out specific things and we know they're knocked out. And within reason, we know that other things are not knocked out as well, although they're always coexisting in carrier mutations and things that go along with this. But it really gave us a number of tools that we could use that simply aren't available in human plasmas. All right, so if we start using some of this, let me walk you through what we did in order to take this uh, assay out for a test drive and really understand how it works. The first experiment we did was uh, to compare wild-type mice with mice that were, whoops, well, you can see it there, deficient in plasminogen. And what you can see is that in the absence of plasminogen, we don't get any plasmin. So in that way, the assay is actually already a little bit better than the thrombin generation assay because there's some leak through in the thrombin generation assay with other inserin proteases that can cleave that fluorogenic substrate. So we're actually really confident we know what it is that we're measuring. We were also able to confirm that by doping in increasing concentrations of alpha-2 antiplasmin, the molecule that inhibits plasmin. And you see we can, in a dose-dependent fashion, suppress the amount of plasmin that we're able to detect. And so we're really confident this is a very specific assay. Um, as uh, Nigel mentioned, um, we know that we have circulating levels of endogenous TPA and UPA at very low levels. Um, we are not sensitive to that, so that's a limitation of this assay, as well as many assays. Um, but we know that when we add recombinant TPA um, to these reactions, we can drive plasma generation in a really dose-dependent fashion. So you see we can go from very low levels up to levels that are akin to what you would see in therapeutic thrombolysis. So in that way, we can tune this reaction to achieve exactly what it is that we want to measure, meaning we have quite a large space that we can test and a lot of clinical applications we may be able to understand. 
Because we have to add quite high concentrations of TPA, we're also not sensitive to Pi-1. So that also makes this a little bit like some of the other assays that Nigel described. So you see here, even when we go up fairly high into Pi-1 concentration, we don't change plasma generation. But if we drop in a conformationally frozen active form of Pi-1, then we can suppress uh, plasma generation. So we know the chemistry is operant, and we know why it's not, uh, why we're not able to detect this. So we begin to really understand what the limitations are, and with knowledge of those limitations, we can begin to understand when we can and can't apply this assay and how to interpret the data. Um, one of the neat things about um, the plasma generation um, biochemistry is that it is dependent on the presence of fibrin. As Nigel says, fibrin mediates its own demise. Um, and that's because the TPA and the plasminogen sit down on that fibrin fiber, and that's necessary in order to generate plasmin. So in order to determine <coughs> if we have that chemistry um, operant in our system, um, we made use of this mouse model. These are fibrinogen deficient mice. And you can see that when we compare wild-type mice with mice that are partially or fully deficient in fibrinogen, we can get a dose-dependent drop in the amount of plasma generation that we get. And so, in fact, we're able to confirm that in the absence of fibrinogen, we don't see plasma generation, which is actually quite nice. Now, that finding actually only enables us to say that the reaction is fibrinogen dependent, but is it really fibrin dependent? And we were able to test that with this really unique strain of mice. These were made by Matt Flick and Jay Deegan. They're mutated in a way in which the fibrinogen circulates normally, but it can't be converted to fibrin. And so we're able to ask a very specific molecular question here, and that is that um, when we decrease the amount of available polymerizable fibrinogen, we can phenocopy what we see when we don't have fibrinogen. And so now we can say with confidence that this reaction is not just fibrinogen dependent, but it's fibrin dependent. And knowing that is actually quite nice, and we'll circle back to how that has enabled us to take on um, future studies. All right, so having characterized that, we were able to start asking questions we didn't necessarily know the answer to. Um, I had assumed, anticipated, that if we then start um, altering the quality or structure of fibrin, we would change aspects of plasma generation. We actually learned that's not true. Um, so here we compared uh, mice that are effectively wild type with mice that are deficient in factor 13 activity, the um, enzyme that cross-links fibrin. And to our surprise, there was uh, no change in plasma generation. And we even were able to confirm that using a pharmacologic approach in which we, when we added a factor 13 inhibitor called T101, and we see no change in plasma generation in these reactions. I don't know if that's necessarily true for every reaction, but in the terms of this reaction, we're um, able to say that there aren't gross changes in plasma generation when fibrin is cross-linked. That tells us a little bit about why factor 13 deficient patients may have a bleeding disorder, and maybe more accurately, why they don't have a, wh why they don't bleed, and that it's not because there's increased plasma generation taking place. The last piece of the biochemistry that I'm going to talk through gets a little bit complicated, but I actually really like this part. Um, this has to do with the ability of thrombomodulin to um, mediate plasmin or mediate fibrinolysis. So the idea here is that a thrombomodulin molecule um, modifies thrombin activity, it's well named, and what happens is that the thrombin thrombomodulin complex is most famous for converting protein C to APC. And of course, the activated protein C inactivates the cofactors and tunes down coagulation. But thrombin and thrombomodulin um, have a secondary function that works in opposition to that, and that is that they facilitate the conversion of TAFI to activated TAFI. This is thrombin activatable fibrinolysis inhibitor. And what this does is it's actually fibrin protective, so it protects the clot from subsequent fibrinolysis. And the fact that these two opposing activities can be attributed to thrombomodulin is a little bit difficult to reconcile without an appreciation of some additional biochemistry that was worked out a number of years ago. And I'm showing some um, really nice work from Laurent Mosnier's group here in which they showed that it's the concentration of thrombomodulin that seems to determine this activity. So low concentrations of thrombomodulin are clot protective. They facilitate TAFI activation. High concentrations of thrombomodulin are anticoagulant, they facilitate APC generation. So can we use this information and see if it can be applied to our reaction? So what we did is we took our, um, our plasma generation assay and we doped in increasing concentrations of recombinant mouse thrombomodulin in our mouse system. We're able to show that these concentrations of uh, thrombomodulin don't change thrombin generation like we had anticipated. These are pretty low levels. 
But we know that these concentrations of thrombomodulin have this really interesting and really powerful effect on clot stability. So you see here, um, this is clot formation and this is clot lysis here by turbidity. And as we increase the concentration of thrombomodulin present, we see the clots are increasingly stable, taking much longer to lyse. As Nigel said, this is really designed to be a very long process. When we go back and put those concentrations of thrombomodulin in the reaction, um, test for plasma generation, we can see that in this beautiful dose-dependent fashion, we get a delay in plasma generation. So what we think is taking place is the fibrin has a chance to form and get really stable before plasma generation begins, um, giving those clots um, some uh, stability in these reactions. All right, so having shown you all of the mouse work, and you can see that we were able to include mice um, carrying variations that simply were not possible in human plasmas, we knew we still needed to turn this into a human-sensitive reaction um, if it was ever going to be relevant in a clinical setting. And so we did that by simply replacing the plasma um, from mice with plasma from humans. And we immediately took the, this um, version of the assay out for a test drive, and we did that with con uh, traditional mixing studies, which is something that's much easier to do with human plasmas. So we showed first that if we mix uh, normal plasma with plasminogen deficient plasma, as we decrease the amount of plasminogen present, we lose plasma generation, just like we did in the mice. Similarly, as we add more TPA, we can enhance plasma generation, again, just like the mice. When we mix with fibrinogen deficient plasma, we learn that this reaction in human plasma is also sensitive to the presence of fibrinogen, and we know this is fibrin from our mouse studies. And if we increase the, uh, decrease the concentration of alpha-2 antiplasmin, we can get more plasma generation. So we're readily able to translate from the mouse system into the human system, and because we've taken that step, we knew exactly which questions to ask and how to go about doing this. All right, so I told you I wanted to make sure that by the end of this you could discuss not only the strengths and the limit, not only strengths, but also the limitations of this assay, and I want to walk through these explicitly on this slide. I've shown you that we have an assay that measures plasma generation kinetics in plasma. The assay is specific to plasmin and sensitive to alpha-2 antiplasmin, so we're able to pick those up. But it is not sensitive to uh, plasma levels of TPA, UPA, or PI-1, at least at basal levels, and we haven't really um, looked at uh, outside the normal levels. But it's tunable with exogenous TPA, so we have the ability to look at rather low levels all the way up to thrombolytic levels. The assay depends on fibrin formation, but not fibrin cross-linking. And it's sensitive to the antifibrinolytic effects of thrombomodulin, which actually gives us a really lot of, a lot of interesting questions we can go in and ask, particularly related to how bleeding may arise from cases in which thrombomodulin is elevated. We've shown that it can be used in diluted plasma, um, enabling small volumes, and we had to do that to, in order to be able to carry out our mouse studies, but it also has implications for other settings in which there isn't much plasma volume around, for example, in neonates and places where there's only leftover plasma that you can take a look at um, plasma generation with. So we think it gives us the ability to look at a lot of studies. We've shown also that the mechanisms are consistent between mouse and human plasma, and so in many of the assays that we do in my lab, we iterate between mouse systems and human systems so that we can ask more and deeper questions with the molecular mechanisms that are taking place. And this gives us the go-ahead to continue doing those style of assays. All right, so having done those series of experiments, we became a little bit of a hammer in search of a nail. Um, looking to see where we could apply this assay in order to translate what we had um, at the bench side to something that was more relevant in a preclinical and clinical setting. What we've done over the last few years, some of this carried out during the pandemic and, and some of it more recently, is to apply this assay in a number of settings. And I'm not going to cover each of these um, except to say that it's actually been really terrific to be able to get samples from clinical colleagues um, and really take our assay and help them understanding more about the me mechanisms that are going on in the clinical scenario as we even learn more about the assays that we have been doing. The assay that I'm going to spend the most time on now is this assay here. Um, it's the assay that preceded the work that we were able to do in collaboration with Nigel and his group to look at how tranexamic acid does or does not affect um, the reactions that we see. And so I'm going to describe this assay now. 
So to get into this study, I want to first introduce Dr. Homa uh, Mazia. Um, Andy introduced us a number of years ago. I think it might have been at FISN, I can't remember, but it's been a phenomenal collaboration. And it's enabled us to take the bench skills that we have, collaborate in a clinical setting, and actually learn some things that I think have been really interesting um, in this multidisciplinary approach for all of us. Um, uh, Dr. Mazia is driven by um, her work as an OBGYN. Um, and I've got one slide of just the fundamental background, which is probably not new to anybody in this room. Um, there are upwards of 300,000 maternal deaths worldwide, and this is reported in 2017. I don't know how the last few years have affected this, um, but I imagine it has not been um, improved much. Um, hemorrhage, of course, is the leading cause of um, death. And in particular, most of those hemorrhage-related deaths occur in the postpartum period. And so this gives us a very targetable um, time frame to go after in terms of having large amounts of impact. And this is, in fact, HOMA's goal. Um, Nigel covered this. There's a number of studies who, that have looked at tranexamic acid specifically in this postpartum, um, postpartum uh, setting. One of these is this very large trial, the WOMAN trial, um, that demonstrated um, when tranexamic acid is given for postpartum hemorrhage, there's decreased death due to bleeding. And then there are also the TRAP uh, and TRAP2 trials. These are smaller trials um, testing specifically the use of tranexamic acid for prophylactic use, prophylactic use um, after vaginal delivery and after cesarean delivery. And each of these also demonstrated efficacy um, in the form of reduced uh, provider-assessed postpartum hemorrhage and um, in, uh, assessed that way or assessed through estimated blood loss or transfusion needs. Um, but each of these trials is based on um, some interesting history, and that is that each of these used one gram of tranexamic acid as the administration dose. And that dose was based on trials in non-pregnant populations, primarily from the setting of trauma or surgery. Um, of course, you all know that there are physiologic changes in pregnancy that alter drug distribution and clearance, meaning that it's not overtly, uh, innately obvious that that uh, concentration or that dosing should translate and in particular, um, both the TRAP and TRAP2 trials um, showed increased nausea and vomiting in the group that received tranexamic acid. So the dose itself is not completely innocuous, even as it is efficacious, and there is room to improve this, and particularly improve that time frame. And so HOMA's obje objective here was to determine the, if the lower dose of tranexamic acid um, could be administered at cord clamp and still prevent postpartum hemorrhage. And so this is the trial that I'm about to um, describe to you. I want to first offer up this quote. It was present in the initial um, report of these data because I really like it and I like the thinking behind it. Um, that is that ideally integrated pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic data and a pharmacometrics approach should be used to guide, to guide drug development and regulatory decisions. And this was the overarching goal with this study. Um, the study turned into three um, publications. I'm going to spend most of my time describing this one and then, of course, our work and how we dovetail into this. And there's another that really describes the meat of the pharmacometric uh, analysis. Um, the study itself, the initial clinical trial, was this. Um, it was tranexamic acid that was given by IV to women undergoing cesarean delivery. Um, there were three groups of individuals um, representing three doses. There was five, 10, and 15 mg per kg dosing strategies um, with 10 individuals per dose. This is the study design in picture format. Um, women gave a pre-dosing blood sample here, then received tranexamic acid at cord clamp, and then continued to give blood samples at defined times after cord clamp. The blood samples were used as blood samples or converted into um, platelet-4 plasma um, and then frozen away for subsequent use. Um, HOMA designed something that I thought was really innovative as this trial was coming together, and that is that knowing that 10 individuals per group were never going to tell us whether somebody actually um, had bleeding or were going to be protected from bleeding, um, she used PD and PK uh, targets as proxies for bleeding. So the PD target um, utilized a, mod a modified ROTEM assay, much like um, the ROTEMs that Nigel described. And the target that was designed here is to have less than 17% maximum lysis at the end of this uh, TPA-triggered reaction. So you see this parameter out here in the tail end of the ROTEM curve. The PK target um, was to achieve greater than 10 micrograms per mil of tranexamic acid in the plasma as the plasma was analyzed. And the analysis was done subsequent to these reactions um, by mass spectrometry and this modeling approach. And we were able then to determine exactly how much tranexamic acid was present in the plasmas as a function of time after administration. <laughs> 
Um, these are the demographic characteristics of the three uh, groups that were studied here. They're small, but I put it up here really to highlight that there was no obvious differences between these groups. And importantly, there was really good diversity given such a small group. And I think that was really to Homo's credit to be able to put that part of this together. All right, so I'm going to summarize exactly what we learned on this. And it's pretty simple to summarize. Um, all of the tranexamic acid doses um, met the PD target. Um, that is that at least there was partial inhibition of clot lysis by Rotem for up to four to six hours after tranexamic acid dosing. And they all met the PK target as well, that there was greater than 10 micrograms per mil that was sustained for at least 45 minutes after dosing in the individuals across the board. The estimated blood loss and the hematocrit was not different between these three dosing groups. And safety readouts that we had, um, including D-dimer and thrombin generation, kinetics measured ex vivo were also not different between the dosing groups. And ultimately, when all the analysis was said and done, um, we predicted that a lower dose of tranexamic acid, that is 650 milligrams, may provide effective postpartum hemorrhage prophylaxis for up to an hour after delivery during that really critical window. And this is almost half as much as the dose that was tested in the larger clinical trials. All right, so we return to the study design here, and we start talking about um, how this was carried out. I'll say that although the PD, uh, the PD readout here was Rotem, um, if you've done Rotem or seen how Rotem is done, um, it's actually not a great assay, not an easy assay to do, in that there's a tremendous amount of variability. The variability is not only inter-individual, but inter-operator. So the technician that's carrying out that assay determines um, the readout, as well as the length of time from arm to um, machine. And so there's a lot of variability that gets introduced. And this is the window we thought mm, the plasma generation assay may be able to fill. Oh, and I just summarized this here. Um, so there's high variability between um, assays and centers. All right, so what would the PGA, plasma generation assay, bring to the table? Well, it could be an, an easier PD endpoint. Um, it does require processing to plasma currently, although there's iterations for whole blood coming on on, online hopefully soon. Um, but that once you have somebody there, which you have to have for a Rotem anyway, if you can get the plasma process to, pl uh, get the blood process to plasma, you can freeze those plasma samples and then analyze things conveniently later. And so that allows for a delayed or batch analysis that can be done. So we eliminate the idea that we have to have inter-assay variability. Um, and we can also test at distal sites, which means that you can collect these samples from different places and analyze them all together. And we can alleviate variability in that regard as well. So to try to determine if we could actually use this assay, I'll return here to the biochemistry that we learned at the very beginning um, with the mouse models. So this is what actually takes place here. Um, the plasminogen and the plasmin sit down on that fibrin by these lysine residues. And of course, Nigel showed this too. Um, tranexamic acid is a lysine mimic, um, so it works as a competitive inhibitor of these binding interactions. And so when the presence of thrombomod uh, in the presence of tranexamic acid, plasminogen, uh, plasminogen and plasmin are not able to sit down on that fibrin fiber. And in that way, it looks to us a lot like there isn't fibrin present. And of course, we know the reaction is quite sensitive to that. Um, we also know that we can easily detect tranexamic acid in vitro. Um, here, we've just illustrated this with a turbidity assay. You see um, fibrin formation here and fibrinolysis. And you see as we increase the concentration of tranexamic acid present, we get a dose-dependent prolongation of the clot lysis time. So this should work. All right, when we put tranexamic acid in our plasma generation assay, in fact, it does work. And it does work really beautifully. Um, you can see, even just looking at the curves, as we increase the concentration of tranexamic acid here, we get a dose-dependent suppression of the plasma generation that we're able to detect. And we can read that out using all of the parameters that we use to characterize this assay. We actually have the ability now to choose the best parameters and understand how tranexamic acid is working. So you see that there's uh, a dose-dependent change in the time to peak in the rate of plasma generation as well as in the peak of plasma generation. And of course, this can be readily appreciated even looking at the curves. Um, the other thing that this shows um, is that tranexamic acid isn't just preventing um, uh, plasmin cleavage of fibrin, but it's actually also preventing um, plasminogen conversion to plasmin. So what you get when you're administering tranexamic acid isn't just protection of the fibrin, but you actually get less plasmin present in general. And since plasmin actually does have other substrates besides just fibrin, it, 
gets us thinking about other mechanisms and um, cleavage reactions that may be reduced by the presence of tranexamic acid. And so we're continuing to use this information from this assay to understand more about the um, biochemistry and uh, mechanism of action of tranexamic acid. All right. So the final piece was to put this together with the clinical samples and see what it is that we get. And in this case, the dovetail with the parent clinical trial in this worked really well in that, if you recall, we have specific and exact measurements of tranexamic acid um, that are present in each one of these samples that we measured. So now we're able to directly correlate plasma generation parameters with exact concentrations of tranexamic acid measured ex vivo. And this is what we get. Um, when we look at the plasma generation assay, I don't know why that's flashing, um, what you see is a nice dose-dependent response, measured tranexamic acid concentrations in the plasma, and in this case, time to peak plasma generation. We also see this in terms of the velocity, it's measured actually really beautifully, um, the peak of plasma generation, and the endogenous plasma potential, or that area under that um, plasma generation curve. And just to put this in context, I'll show you what these same dosing regimens look like in terms of the ROTEM readouts. So this is the ROTEM readouts for um, maximum lysis, and then we also tested against this LI30 here. And what you see in all of these is there is some variability on the individual scale for reading out each one of these, but you can immediately appreciate there's an awful lot more dots off the line here in the ROTEM assays compared to what we're really picking up in some of the parameters of the plasma generation assay. If we actually go in and do some mathematical modeling of these reactions in that pharmacometric approach that um, HOMA cited in the original study, um, what we learn is that the plasma generation assay is offering us less within subject variability and less between subject variability. So we're actually able to get more precise measurements from these reactions, and in terms of uh, uh, translating this to future trials may enable us to use fewer samples or fewer individuals and obtain the same kind of information because we're not fighting this variability, this assay-induced variability um, problem that we all uh, recognize as inherent in ROTEM. All right, so I'll summarize um, the second half of this um, in the clinical um, study. We've shown that the plasma generation assay detects pharmacologically relevant tranexamic acid concentrations, and these can be administered in vitro or administered in vivo and then tested ex vivo, giving us a lot of potential to iterate between these systems. We've shown that tranexamic acid reduces TPA-mediated plasmin generation and not just plasmin function. So it's actually led to a newer appreciation of what's taking place, and maybe we can apply that to understand more about the downstream consequences of tranexamic acid administration. The PG parameters show less within and between subject variability compared to whole blood ROTEM. Because the ability, and then that also means the ability to assay in frozen and thawed plasma samples can enable robust measurements of tranexamic acid across distal collaborating centers, particularly important if you have smaller populations and you need to pool resources from multiple centers to be able to examine this kind of a readout. Overarching conclusions when I put all of these things together. Um, I've shown you that the plasma generation assay is specific and sensitive to established biochemistry, and it does so in both mouse and human plasmas. It enables comparison of the kinetics of thrombin generation and plasma generation together by doing these reactions in parallel, which provides us with more detailed information than just looking at clotting or lysing assay, fibrinolysis assays alone. We can get a deeper understanding of these reactions that are taking place. We can use this plasma generation assay alone, or we can use it in addition to the gold standard ROTEM and get an understanding of not only the enzyme generation, but also the clot um, formation and stability. And the use of this assay either alone or with ROTEM or other assays um, may reveal fibrinolytic abnormalities in other clinical settings. And so these are an example of the settings that we've been looking at. Um, we've looked a little bit at bleeding of unknown cause and have some really interesting data that will come out later this year that we've done in collaboration with Ingrid Pabinger and Johanna Gebhardt's group. We've looked at thrombosis risk and viral infection, and by that I do mean COVID, um, and we've shown abnormalities there. Um, we've looked at um, settings of liver disease where there's a lot of really complex changes that are still poorly understood, and we're currently looking at oral contraceptive use, a setting in which there's increased thrombotic risk for still un, uh, unknown uh, and unclear reasons. 
So I will conclude by thanking a number of people. I'd like to thank my lab, um, who are really great to talk to about this, Matt Flick's lab in particular for the use of the mouse models, um, Nigel's lab for collaboration on the clinical cohorts that allow us to take this into um, more human relevant settings. We're not just saving mouse lives, but we're maybe one day saving human. Um, and a number of other institutions, um, including in particular HOMA, who really did a phenomenal job putting together that study and is following it up now with additional studies. And I will thank you for your time and attention, and I'll be happy to field questions.